Wow. Woo! <laughs> Blast off. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us here uh, for our talk this afternoon, Bricked and Abandoned, How to Keep the IoT or the Internet of Things from Becoming an Internet of Trash. My name is Paul Roberts, and I'm going to be moderating our discussion today. I am uh, the publisher and editor-in-chief at the Security Ledger. Uh, I'm the head of editorial content at Reversing Labs, and I'm also the founder of a new nonprofit called SURF, the Secure Resilient Future Foundation. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But our conversation today is going to focus on the problem of abandonware and end-of-life devices. The idea behind this panel really came out of work that I and others on this panel have done uh, on the issue of the right to repair our stuff. And uh, Tara and Corey have both been involved in that movement. And there, that's a project that has shown, had some real successes in the last few years. Uh, five states have enacted uh, comprehensive electronics right to repair laws. Uh, and uh, yep, in in including um, uh, home appliances, uh, iPads, iPhones, uh, and most recently in Colorado, uh, Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Uh, most recently in Colorado, agricultural devices, uh, farm equipment, uh, as well as B2B devices. So Cisco routers and stuff that you sell to companies. Um, lobbyists had done a good job getting carve outs for that, but uh, Colorado just passed a law that includes that. So that's great. Um, Colorado, Oregon ban practices like part serialization and part pairing, uh, and that's wonderful. But even with the right to repair, and this is kind of where this panel comes from, uh, we still have issues, um, and consumers, businesses, and communities uh, are still finding themselves at the mercy of manufacturers, and that's because our current mix or mess, depending on how you look at it, of IP and copyright laws and policies, as well as decades of kind of a hands-off approach to uh, market consolidation by our government, give companies these days a uh, pretty wide latitude when they sell a smart product to the public. And I'll just kind of use the example that I and many others have used, which is you might go out to Best Buy and buy a smart refrigerator with a touchscreen panel. Uh, that hardware might have a useful life of a couple decades um, or more. Uh, the software, you know, maybe they're gonna support it for three years, five years, something like that. But that's the extent of their commitment uh, to that product. So. What's going on over there? Um, so uh, that's kind of the the gist or the, the heart of what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, to get us started, I think it's a good idea to introduce our panelists. We've got an amazing panel. And uh, let them, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce them and then just let them say hi to you and then We'll get going. So uh, immediately to my left is uh, Mr. Chris Weisopel. Chris is the CTO of Veracode a provider of application security and testing technology. He began his career as a vulnerability researcher and renowned hacker with The Loft. In 1998, Chris and six of his Loft colleagues, including Mudge, who was uh, talking in this room earlier today, testified before the U.S. Senate on matters of U.S. government cybersecurity. And uh, Chris, welcome. Thanks, Paul. Great to be here. All right. Next to Chris, we have the amazing Tara Wheeler. Uh, Tara is the founder and CEO of Red Queen Dynamics and a senior fellow in global, global cyber policy at the Council of Foreign Relations and a well-known speaker and writer on topics that include cyber warfare, security best practices, future trends, and more. Tara. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Next to Tara, we have Corey Doctorow. I think all of us know Corey. He's a science fiction writer, author, activist, and journalist, and the author of many books. Most recently, uh, The Bezel and The Lost Cause in 2020. He was inducted into the Canadian Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame. I probably missed a more recent book, but. <laughs> you, you blow me away. Yeah. Um, I am. I'm blown away by how many, how much you've written. Uh, and next to Corey, Dennis Gies, who is a researcher with a focus on uh, 
uh, the cybersecurity and privacy of Internet of Things devices. He is best known for his research on the uh, security of vacuum robots and method and methods, which we're going to talk about for liberating these devices and user data from manufacturer control. Dennis. Okay. Uh, hold on. How do I control this slide? Okay, there we go. So, uh, you know, the backstory for this panel, right, is we have an epidemic of end of life devices, and it's an epidemic that is going to grow in proportion to the growth of the Internet of Things. Uh, 29 billion IoT devices are projected by 2030. Uh, they're probably more than 20 billion now. Uh, and as I said, with the kind of smart refrigerator, there's a divergence between the useful life of hardware measured in decades and software support, maybe measured in years, maybe months. Um, and there are currently aren't any laws in the US anyway that mandate periods of support. So end of life decisions for devices are really driven by bottom line concerns for the manufacturers. Uh, you know, the age of the product, the product, you know, the profitability of the product, the cost of maintenance. Um, not informed by things that should matter, like the useful life of the hardware, uh, the cost of replacement for the consumer who purchased the device, uh, or even more importantly, the cost to our planet of uh, e-waste that ends up in landfills and poisons our environment, uh, as well as, you know, kind of the security risks of uh, unsupported and end-of-life devices, which are becoming uh, a more prevalent issue. Um, so, but behind all of this is this kind of bigger phenomena of what Corey has really wonderfully termed in shitification, uh, <laughs> which is a phenomena that is a growing phenomenon, and I thought I'd just turn the mic over to Corey. Just, Corey, if you could just talk to the audience. What is inshitification and, you know? Well, so first of all, everybody likes to swear. So inshitification <laughs> is like a million word I've come up with for talking about this stuff, but it's the one that caught off in the first academics put the words in it. <laughs> but it's, it's foundationally is this idea that all the platforms are doing that right now. And then unlike the platforms that we had before, where they go back, we still have to keep using them. They have us locked in, and they become critical to our lives, and not subject to external sources of this planet, or departments, or regulators, or even new folks, right? Their own workforce. It needs to be a lot more empowered. Like, that before it's happening, about 260,000 people in 2023, another 100,000 this year, for six months of this year. It used to be that when the boss told you to make something garbage, you can tell your boss how to fuck themselves because someone else will give you a job and your boss can find someone else to do your job. Well, these days, all of the sources of discipline that used to stop your boss from going to the education level or engaging it and having to go all the way to 100, all of those sources have melted away. And so we have these platforms that are getting all that slightly worse. I'm not shouting at this for about an hour or two more. I can maybe do this room if you want to hear more. That's right, there's. Put it on your calendar. There's a much longer discussion of initiation, but Corey, thank you. So, uh, I think the 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 other piece of this, though, is that these are not problems that are specific. I mean, these are not. This is not just a consumer rights issue or a you know access issue. It's also increasingly, as I said, a cybersecurity issue. We're at DEF CON here. It's a cybersecurity conference, um, and so these issues are are you know forefront in our mind. Um, Chris, could you just talk about kind of how the, you know, this, these issues with end of life and abandoned devices impact cybersecurity, not just for consumers, but for businesses as well? Right. So we, we all know that a lot of software is built insecure by design, right? That's why we all find vulnerabilities in the stuff that's out in the field. And there's lots of reasons for that. It's, it's basically a business decision that, that the manufacturers make. Not to, not to invest in security. And there's no incentives for them to do that, especially if it's like an off-brand device or an inexpensive device. You're gonna get less security, but if it has an IP address and it's on the internet, um, that's what attackers like, like to, to use it for, to maybe create a, a DDoS botnet like we saw with Mirai, or more recently, uh, we've seen with the Volt Typhoon and the KV botnet, um, where it was Soho routers that were end of life to uh, that were that were leveraged to uh, you know hide hide attacks. It's actually a great way for attackers 
to hide where they're coming from because they can appear to come from the same a, a, a network that's close to the target because these devices are, are everywhere. And in Full Typhoon, it actually was in Guam. Uh, the Chinese hackers hacked um, the Soho routers and they were able to appear like they were just coming from Guam, right? So when they were attacking ICS infrastructure. So um, that's just sort of a, a, a present threat that we get. It's an environmental threat that harms the ecosystem um, that we all rely on. Um, if, you're, if you're a defender, it's harder to defend if it looks like it's coming from one of your employees working from home, right? Because it's coming from a home router from a local ISP. Um, so this, this effect where no incentives for these manufacturers to actually build security in and invest in doing that um, leads to us all having worse security. Um, and some of the other reasons that they, they, they have a problem doing this is because you know, building secure software is hard, right? It, it actually takes expertise, it takes investing time and, and tooling, and actually the tooling isn't as good in the firmware space as it is in some of the general purpose you know, Windows and, and Linux software spaces when you're dealing with these embedded devices. The tooling's not as good, you have to rely on manual um, uh, penetration testings and manual code review more. Um, so these drive up the cost. So there's less, in, there's less incentives to send, set, spend the money. The, the uh, other thing I want to mention though is the cost of uh, up updating. Like there's a cost to updating software. And we know if you're, you find vulnerabilities after you've shipped the product, you're going to have to update the software. And updating IoT devices is actually harder than updating general purpose software like Chrome and, and Windows and, and, and Mac and things like that. Because when you have a failure mode, you don't really have a great interface for someone to deal with it, right? So you have to invest a lot more for these a robust update process that is less prone to failure. And you're doing this on devices that are inexpensive. So we just have a complete mismatch of incentives when it comes to especially uh, in inexpensive devices. And you know, some of these Soho routers are like 100 bucks, right? So there's, there's not a lot of incentives to invest in security. So I mean, I think one of the things that, that is you know kind of picking up on what Chris what you were saying is you know the, obviously this hugely uh, growing internet of things it's working its way into our homes into our businesses into sensitive environments obviously but it's really sort of from a security and you know uh, quality standpoint a black box which is why I wanted Dennis Gies on this panel because more than most other people in this planet Dennis has familiarized, don't, yes, that's true, Dennis, don't, don't be humble, uh, has peered deeply into the workings of smart connected devices, uh, vacuum robots and uh, smart doorbells, and you name it. Um, so Dennis, um, if you could just kind of tell us a little bit, just give us a sense of under the hood of these connected devices, whether they're end of life or not end of life, what are the types of things that you're finding and what are the types of you know, problems that exist out there? Yeah, so that's the question. So primarily it's actual family. We have to the bosses, so the bosses like secrets are more interesting. And so um maybe class on so my experience is perfectly uh six and a half the bosses of the door by now uh so you can get the mobile to make the mobiles because these devices have uh cameras and nowadays and they are very powerful and they you know have one thing that I noticed quite often was that um, all the data is recycling their models and the same time. So you know, if you buy a model today, it's just going to be the same out there that was not the same thing. Um, so if you just release your ones that are coming here, then I expect you to buy one because you want to more and change more. But there is a the line that it's still at the same time because the data is still as many of the processes and it's still the same time. Um, one thing that is just back from my perspective, and this is the reason why I did my research, is that vendors uh, are definitely in the open power store. Um, we have seen an example of this in Red Hat about an hour where we have a vacant moment which was at least less than a half year ago, less than a year ago. But we got stopped, uh, it's not yet to import something like that in Mars, so like, basically a couple months of the post release, basically, we didn't really say that about this. Um, it's not necessarily bad, but in this particular case, uh, there's a Google's uh, media report exclusion, which we didn't catch until today, but it's kind of bad. Um, the other thing is, um, 
has mentioned that the pathway is more or less the same, but it's there is so much that you see in the because the people kind of think the case was at one they were a super violent and a bit violent and they go beyond the And this uh I think for me it's kind of very very sad because it's very um, that's the reason why we have like um tried to find a third place from um during the whole process and trying to also be uh, in the past, so maybe, uh, sorry, I mentioned the place, I just now uh, it disappear, not just to avoid that. But the same thing I've put down the other one, but eventually I feel that they're bringing up some of the things that they're going to be facing. Uh, so far, I mean, it's kind of successful, I think they have more of the three weeks of spelling, uh, users of one of the Google devices that they use about the mechanism, which actually would be the console, uh, they can even turn it into the mechanism, I think, that could be. Um, it doesn't allow also to debug the devices because sometimes when they said it's more kind of quirky for us, when they're doing the thing, they can all of this. If you have one here, like a mini attack, it's one here, it's stuck like in the light of trouble, and the tool does not work anymore, and you get this to figure out what cause it is. And the light of trouble is a problem. It's a little bit of a problem. It's a little bit of a problem. It's a little bit of a problem. So, this is a huge issue, which I think is a very good idea. It's a little bit of a problem. Each year, I want to have a bigger place to figure out what we can do with the software. And as you know, the state of the world, I think the other person is getting all the vulnerability. We just need to find two other ways to fix these things themselves and all the other. So I think one of the questions that looms over this panel and over this problem is like, what is what should we do about this, right? As an economy, as a society, uh, as consumers, as businesses. Um, and Tara Wheeler is has actually testified before Congress on these these very issues of how do we sort of codify this notion of public health and security into our laws so that we can get predictable outcomes and, and desirable outcomes. So Tara, just, I mean, talk a little bit about that, uh, framing this from a policy perspective and what types of things, what types of changes we need. It's been an interesting experience speaking in front of Congress on something like this because it goes straight to the heart, I think, of who I am and where I started in technology. And the answer is when you want a policymaker to listen to you, appeal to their heartstrings, appeal to their emotions and tell a story. I'll talk a little bit about what that means, but before that happens, I wanna pull a little bit at your heartstrings right now because there's a very special guest sitting right here in front of me. My dad came to my very first DEF CON panel right here. Yeah, you wanna stand up? Yeah, yeah. I am so, so sorry about all those remote controls. <laughs> and that's where a lot of this comes from. You have to start with policymakers by appealing to their curiosity and bringing stories to them about why you love and care about the right to repair, about e-waste, about abandonware. And it starts with who you are as a person. The answer about how to give good testimony, and I want to talk with every single person in here who wants to know how to do testimony to your state and local legislators, as well as the US Congress and Senate. Frankly, I am less qualified to do that than this guy right here, so bug him first, right? Uh, but right after that, it's about figuring out what we want them to do. We need to start bringing a conversation about who we are as cybersecurity professionals and InfoSec pros. And that means coming from who you are as a person, telling the truth and making it funny if you can. Can I grab that slide, Paul? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. What I would love to do is I'd love to point out the single greatest testimony that's ever happened in front of the United States Senate. Well, no, not this one. It's the one, it's the one before this. It should be, hopefully. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, folks of all persuasions, Mr. D. Snyder of Twisted Sister. Woo! Right? Woo! Absolutely. This, this is the greatest testimony I've ever seen. So anybody in here worried about purple hair and piercings, I got a few of them myself, bring who you are and a true story and speak directly to the heart of the policymakers you're talking to. Even the least funny out of all of us can make something funny if it's true, right? This one right here. I don't know if that's gifting. I can't see right now. We know about the laptop snag, but remember, Senator, we run ads. The challenge that policymakers have is they need to have someone speak to them at their level, at their high level about what technology is, how it works, and explain it carefully and conscientiously. So I, I want to talk more about that, but before I do, 
I want to talk about what it means to not have that in place. Right now, we don't have a sense of public health. You can pop back to just my picture if you want to, because nobody wants to look at this all day long, I'm thinking. <laughs> uh, so the challenge we're really having is we need to start relating this to public health issues. We have a crisis of e-waste, abandoned wear, uh, my God, thank you for letting me say, and shittification in front of my father right now, Corey. It's amazing. So sorry. I did, I'm, I'm grounded. Uh, so the important thing here is to think about how we can relate this to questions of public health. The fact that we have a crisis of unupdated IoT devices, just as Chris has said, the fact that we are looking at a, a, a plague of in shittified devices that haven't and can't be repaired or that we are blocked from repairing is absolutely unforgivable. And this is the last thing I'll say. The United States Small Business Administration has allocated $6 million to assist cybersecurity in small businesses this year. That is six million with an M numbers of dollars. When you break that out across the 33.6 million small businesses in the United States, that is 18 cents per small business or not enough to let me put extra whipped cream on my pumpkin spice latte. Okay? I am I'm infuriated by that because I started in my journey in tech with another great member of my family, my stepdad, building computers for him, ATX mini towers, when I was 16, the first time I dropped out of high school. All right? Sorry about that one too. And the answer that I think we all have to have is that this goes to the, the, the need we have to let people in our community start at every level of technology. Building and repairing small devices is something that is accessible to everybody at all levels. It's small businesses, it's women, it's people of color, it's people that didn't have some of the educational opportunities that people in this room had. I want to see that support for them. Let me know if you want to learn how to speak to your policymakers, and I will absolutely help if I can. So I want to talk about a framework for understanding this. There are a lot of things about these IoT devices that work back at their design and the DOL and But there's something else really important, which is that they fail badly too. So if you're 18, one of the ways your printer works badly is you want to charge ten thousand dollars a gallon for me. So you use DRM on your ink cartridge to keep your parts current and shape point. The ink cartridge goes in to make sure it's come up not refilling their cartridge and running third party cartridge. But that's not enough, right? Because people are going to update their firmware with alternative firmware that lets them not pay ten thousand dollars a gallon for ink. So you put DRM on the firmware too. But that gets defeated until by people who are reprogramming the law. So they can do things like ship big security updates to printers that say this is updating your device security, or it's actually doing this updating which they can reject your work and cartridges. Uh, so this is why they put all this stuff in it, and you look at every IoT device, and this is more or less what they're all doing. Uh, but what that means is that even when they're not trying to extract a money from you and screw you over, you are still restricted by the laws that surround these restrictive technologies. And so when it's the allowed to you want to make alternative firmware, or so when there's a bug and they won't fix it and you want to write your own app, all of that stuff is still in play, even when they put these out of business, because the Digital Money Copyright Act, for example, is a copyright law, which means that it is in effect for the full duration of the copyright of the software and the device, which is 90 years. And so the company could be ashes, but unless you know for sure, that there isn't someone who is the current owner of that copyright who won't come after you and pursue prosecution under the DMC, which makes it a felony punishable by a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine to distribute to the benefit tool, then you're never going to be able to not make that count. And even if there's a hobby that you're willing to risk that, no firm is going to do it, no business is going to do it. We're going to be able to go to the genius bar or the whatever the best buy version is and say, here's this great thing that you want to bring it for me. Not because they don't receive a way of making money out of that, but because doing so has all of this legal risk that arises out of a company that might not even exist in It's like a zombie risk. Yeah, excellent points. And I, I should say, we're coming here not to kind of wag our finger at you. We're actually coming here to get your input and ideas. Like, this is the audience. You are the folks that we're trying to reach and get um, activated around this issue. So, um, if you have questions, if we have said things that have, you know, got 
ideas turning in your mind, you want to get up and, and throw a question up to this panel, we don't need to wait for the end. There are mics up there. Feel free to get up. Um, there's actually a little incentive to ask a question, which is iFixit has given a couple little like tools uh, for us to share with the audience. They're a big supporter of Right to Repair. So um, ask a question and come choose your iFixit tool. <laughs> Just to review some, uh, excellent. So just to review some of the uh, some of the most notable recent like abandonware cases. Obviously, there was the Spotify car thing that you might have read about. Uh, this was a portable uh, streaming kind of touch device that uh, Spotify sold to vehicle owners who didn't have a late model car but wanted to use Spotify in their car. Um, cost a couple hundred dollars. Uh, started selling it uh, in February 2022. Within six months had decided that they were um, not going to produce it anymore and slash the price. And then a little less than two years later uh, announced that in, in uh, May of this year uh, announced that they were actually just bricking the device. They were cutting out, you know, shutting down the servers that supported the um, streaming services and basically turning it into a paperweight. And when asked what uh, their customers should do about it, they said, well, they should, you know, um, call their local recycling center and take it to the recycling center. So um, this is a great example of, you know, the, the, the dire position that consumers uh, find themselves in. You could drop hundreds of dollars on a device and three, six months later find out that uh, it doesn't work anymore. We've seen it happen. Uh, Belkin's uh, Wemo neck cam in 2020. Uh, these were devices that were working for seven plus years, uh, helping monitor people's homes. Uh, Belkin announced in April 2020 they were bricking the devices. Effective May 2020. <laughs> a month later. In the middle of a pandemic, there were a lot of people who were using these to monitor, uh, you know, vacation homes and, and remote homes who were then sort of like, holy cow, like, how am I going to see what's going on in this, in my home? I have to either go out and switch a hardware and risk catching COVID or just kind of have the light, have the camera shut off. Um, so that was another one. And then there were Chromebooks. Uh, this is uh, sort of a happy story. Uh, it turned out happy, which was, you know, uh, in the height of the pandemic, school districts went to one-to-one -one student to technology uh, to allow remote learning. Um, many of them bought Chromebooks because they're low-cost devices relatively and did basically what they needed to do, use Google Classroom and stuff like that. Um, what they didn't realize is that many of those devices had uh, four to five year, uh, well, four year software support lifespans, but that was from the data manufacturer, not from the data purchase. So districts that purchase them off a shelf where they've been sitting for two years might only had two years of support. Um, and the cost, first of all, as these devices reach the end of their support lifespan, a lot of the functionality, the ability to access these applications, Google Classroom and stuff, went with them um, and they were basically useless to the districts. Rather, uh, the cost was to replace them was going to be massive, uh, close to $2 billion. Uh, but fortunately, there was a kind of grassroots movement. There was a lot of pushback and, and Google uh, kind of read the writing on the wall and decided to extend the, export, the support life uh, for those devices from four years to 10 years, allowing them to kind of live most of their useful life. So these are, there. then there are many more examples of this that are that are popping up. Um, I'll take a question, yeah. Uh, can we turn that mic on? Yeah. Just hit the, tap the mic until it makes a noise. There, you there go. it is, okay, good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you said at the beginning the main problem for pricking is not the hardware, it's the software. And so because it has to maintain, it cannot be stuck, we have security issues, we all know this. So what about a law who said when you discontinue your product, the software should be public domain, open source. So I, then, I think that's a great idea. Then we have on the one side, hopefully a community who said, okay, I have this product at home, I can fix it, I know what we're doing, and hopefully everyone else can download the results. And when the, con when the manufacturer is uh, worried about, oh, too much knowledge, too much know-how is left, yes, then he should continue his product. So, so he has the free choice when it's open. That so would that would be a good solution and that's sort of in the category of end of life planning, right? Like when you buy a device, there should be a disclosure of what is the end of life planning for that device after support is ended or if the company goes out of business, what, how, how are you going to, what's going to happen with that device? It isn't just like maybe the open source so you can 
patch that. Uh, I mean, when it's open source, then you can patch the open source packages, which are inevitably going to have vulnerabilities years down the road. But like, what will the device do if it isn't connected to the network anymore? Like, will my speaker still work via Bluetooth? You know, like, or does the device not work at all? So this end of life planning is something that we definitely advocate for. And I'll certainly add to that. We've had this conversation before. I strongly believe there needs to be a graceful fail into default open source for any company that goes under and leaves its devices on the open market. That graceful fail into open source licensure, into the ability to edit, access, fix, or trash your devices as you choose, as you are the person that purchased them, is I think a, a real keystone and I think one of the goals of the people here to try to make sure that by default, devices can't be fail closed when it comes to software liability and the capacity to update them. Yeah, I, I, I have a long sympathy for Dr. Foster, and I would say that you know, if you've ever heard people talking about orphan works and copyright, usually they're talking about things like photographs or books or where they're rights holders can't be identified for these are very esoteric issues that are usually taken up by like, people who care about an archive of rules media, but this is an issue for software people too, right? These orphan words are often software, they're often firmware. But I also want to say that I think as actors who have grown up under the shadow of the uh, fights about free software, who provides for software, that we tend to think of those as the two poles. The software is designed to be maintained by third parties, and the software where if you want to maintain, you have to do the tedious business that you can file and manage. I want to say that actually the two poles are, on the one hand, software, whether or not it's designed to be maintained by third parties, and software they can be a person for And while I think it would be great to have a rule that says we uh, are going to force companies to make it easy to maintain their products that they go out of business or if they stop supporting the product, I think we could start very productively with we should just not make it legal to figure out how a thing is going to work and make it work better. Yeah. Yeah. So, the conclusion to that, I mean, for me, as someone who's working on IT devices, it would be a way to announce that the vendors with the most and what the group is. So, I'm looking at making a fixed phone for the number of devices where uh, they don't want to change. And you heard earlier that we had these state rights or fair laws. One interesting uh, law is the one that was passed in Oregon, when they just said, okay, you're a poor state, but you can't change federal copyright laws, but tell you what, you can't sell the product in Oregon if you use parts there. Right? So, like, we can't tell you whether or not copyright, how copyright law works. That's not our business in the state has We sure as hell tell you when you can sell it here. And so there is an awful lot of power for the state to step in to say, a, a, a good or service is unmarked. Yep. If it is designed in a way that makes it hard for third parties to maintain. Yeah, and I mean, I think I think we all kind of underestimate the degree to which this strange, you know, world that we, the strange environment that we live in. Um, kind of affects us, um, you know, just the lack of incentives for companies to do the right thing that, you know, like as with Spotify, although Spotify did eventually backtrack and agree to reimburse customers for uh, the cost of the, the device, um, but that was completely voluntary. There was no law requiring them to do that. Um, Generally, the cost of disposal is borne entirely by the consumer, by their community, uh, to, which might have a contract with an e-waste uh, company, and of course by the planet. Um, and it, it also kind of messes with our reality, and I'll note, in the front row is Jeremy O'Sullivan, who founded the company Kitsch, that um, ran, that had a case with, uh, with uh, McDonald's ice cream, soft ice cream makers. You've all read about this. So kind of liberate those devices, make them more accessible and repairable for uh, McDonald's franchise owners. Um, we all were walking around trying to get, you know, McFlurries, 
and being like, why can't I get a McFlurry? And behind that is this kind of skewed funhouse mirror of, you know, locked down inaccessible equipment and machinery. Um, so, you know, I think we all kind of underestimate the, the, the depths of this problem. Uh, yes? Oh, geez. Uh, well, this one's going to be simpler than the last. Uh, Tara, how can we contact you if we want to learn how to speak to our state and local reps? Thank you so much. Uh, Tara at InfoSec Exchange, get me on Mastodon is the best way to get me, or t at tara.org. Email me personally. I want to know. What's your name, man? Uh, David. David. I, absolutely. Literally email me right now and I will talk to you within the next t hour. t at tara.org. t at tara.org. Okay. I trust That's an you. Email address? <laughs> mm -hmm. Folks, the only time I ever saw somebody go out of business as a result of right to repair laws. You hear Apple and Google all the time talking about how they're going to go out of business if they don't have parts pairing, if they don't have the ability to lock their devices down. I watched two businesses go out of business and they were both women owned small companies in Seattle, Washington that did battery housing resolders and screen replacements for Googles and, and iPhones for pixels and iPhones. Those are the small businesses I watched go out of business. I'm still teeth grindingly angry about it and that is the reason why the state and local advocacy for right to repair and to prevent abandonware is that important because it's small businesses that need a chance to compete and they're the ones getting locked out. So I care about it. I'm going to get mad about it. I want you to get mad about it too. It sounds like you are. I'll help you stay mad and get eloquent about it. Wait, how do you spell Tara? Uh, T-A-R-A-H. 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 Yeah. We all yeah. one word, all lowercase. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. Holy doctor, just I should also know we we and we're gonna have a sign up at the end of this piece. We also have this sure. new organization called Secure Resilient Future Foundation, SURF, yeah. uh, that is a group to that is basically exists to organize this community, the cybersecurity community, around these issues and give us a voice at the policy table, right? So that these laws can be informed by the knowledge and expertise that people in this room have. So I'll I'll throw that up at the end of the presentation. Um, I guess running just and then we'll try and get to uh, one or two more questions. But um, so we we heard the make everything open source. That that's a that feels good to all of us, but may or may not be practical. Are there some other options or or possibilities for policies that might help with this problem that that you would advocate? So I, I think just like information disclosure around what you're getting when you buy something is super important, and and that there's some teeth to that. Like the FTC says, hey, you said you know, uh, Spotify car thing, you're gonna support this for four years and you're bricking it, like you're, you're going to get fined or you have to have action. So there, there should be some clear disclosures around, um, you know, end of life planning, how long you're gonna get updates and then a way for things like the FTC to hold companies accountable. I mean, if I ask people in this room, like how long are you getting updates on your various smart TVs in your house, or other IoT devices and speakers and things in your house, you probably wouldn't know, right? Like, there's no consistent way. You, it's probably in some fine print if it's there at all. So I think some of the regulation that we would like to see is just some transparency and hold people accountable to what they say when they sell these devices. I also think that procurement is a huge lever, mm -hmm. right? The, all levels of government are enormous consumers of these products, and everybody wants to sell something to Uncle Sucker. And I tell you what, when Abraham Lincoln was running the Union Army, when he was the commander in chief, he only bought rifles with interoperable tooling and ammunition because it would be embarrassing to be the commander in chief of the United States during the Civil War and have to go to Gettysburg and say, sorry boys, war's canceled this week. Our sole supplier isn't making ammunition anymore, right? So if our government can say to firms, as a matter of prudent public administration, we will not acquire a product from you unless you create a binding covenant not to attack third parties that we uh, source in order to maintain, improve, or extend the functionality of those products, not because we're ideological info hippies, but because we want to buy things with public money that represent good value. Um, I have a suggestion regarding the uh, line of questioners, which is yes. you could take all of their questions in one go and then 
or, Sounds or, good. Or maybe in threes and try and round them all up? Yeah, let's do it. So step up, ask your question, and then we will answer them as a group. Go ahead. I will try and keep this as brief as possible. I am uh, obviously in the cyber field. I have the knowledge, um, but I am also a uh, single dad of three kids. I have an immense amount of time put into parenting and providing. I. I struggle to find time to research and understand and find products that don't have these issues. What uh, we all know that policy takes forever to actually implement. Uh, I will not be that naive. What is some things that we can take home and proselytize today um, to mon pods? You know, pe or the working man, the low end, uh, the low income families. What can we do to communicate to them how to prevent and avoid some of the crap that's actually out there? Excellent question. A uh, couple more. Yeah, uh, I wrote my dams longer. Sorry. Um, I wanted to think about incentives for startups for the kinds of folks who are building stuff. So can't hear you. We can't hear can you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Better. Good. Okay. So when you first start a hardware company that's making things for people to buy, it's a miracle that it works at all. It's just fantastic that people are buying your product from you. It's so good. It feels amazing. And then six years later, the worst thing in the world happens. You have 11 SKUs. You promise to support them forever because you love your customers. And now you have this horrible feeling like, oh no, the chipset manufacturer doesn't support my firmware anymore. I cannot ship updates. I'm broken. And you have to have a terrible, painful conversation with your customers and your business. Mm -hmm. But you never think about that the first two, three years you're starting the company. How do we give people incentives as they're building their software company in the first place to do the right thing, to put a nutrition label on the box with the years it's going to work, or to, to give people a realistic expectation of how long something's going to keep working? Sure. What do we do to make that good for folks? Thank you. Thanks. All right. So I guess the my question maybe ties in a little bit with that, but more on the software side of things. So I look at a lot of devices that have uh, commercial dependencies that are expensive for an individual, so how would you handle, like, okay, if they're releasing their code as open source, how do you handle those dependencies so consumers can still maintain their device? Why don't we take, yeah, we'll take all five. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, take, take all, all five. five. Okay. Uh, if these things go through, what can we expect as consumers to change? Um, for instance, like, will these companies say, like, hey, we need to keep making money, so all of these devices cost double or something like that, like, will you expect any sort of blowback as a result of some of these decisions? Yep. Good question. Does the EU have any regulations in place for things like this? Yes. Okay. Uh, I could start quickly with the last one. Yep. Uh, the, well, I know the UK does. Uh, they, they require you to disclose um, and clearly how long you're going to support the device when you buy the device. Um, and I think the EU has that too. They do not have that in the United States. So the EU has passed some laws uh, regarding device support uh, uh, for certain types of devices, home appliances and electronics and so on. It's not comprehensive, but it does a lot of what you're asking. To answer at least a bit of the question about what to do when you are hopeful about a product and six, six years later it's crazy. I'm the CEO of a software company. I understand the desire to see a beautiful future, but I do think we need to opt to advantage the smallest businesses in the United States first whenever it comes to uh, providing access to tools, equipment, and any, uh, any product that needs to be maintained and repaired. And the reason for that is we have a giant supply chain issue in the United States with small businesses unable to sell to the US government because they don't have the training people, personnel, and supplies necessary to do so. Anything that takes away from the US small business ability to learn technology, implement it, and create economic solutions for the local communities they're part of is something we've got to step back away from. Opt to, opt to empower them. I, I want to speak briefly to the question of commercial dependencies. Uh, and what happens if you uh, have licensed some technology for a device that is expensive to uh, license on an ongoing basis. So this is where something called Ulysses Pacts are very useful. So you'll know if you've read your Homer that Ulysses was this hacker who sailed across the ocean and he sailed through the sea where the sirens were, right? And if you listen to the song of the sirens, you jump into the sea and die. And so Ulysses said to his sailors, instead of using the standard protocol, which is to fill my ears with wax so I don't get to hear the cool siren song, I want you to tie me to the mast so that I can still hear them but live to tell the tale. No matter what I do, don't untie me, 
right? So Ulysses packs are like throwing away the Oreos the night you go on a diet, right? It's the things that you do when you're strong to defend yourself against which, when you're weak. A lot of the uh, uh, systems that we build now for remote updating and cloud software as a service are the opposite of a Ulysses pack. It's impossible to defend yourself against your worst impulses. And an example here would be uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, which uh, licensed a technology called Pantone, which is important for printing out uh, high fidelity colors. And they had to pay a license fee to Pantone. And one day Pantone said, we want more money. And Adobe said, no, we're not gonna pay it anymore. And Pantone said, fine, every image that anyone has ever created in Photoshop, Illustrator, or any other program that has Pantone colors in it, from now on, when people open that image in Creative Cloud, those colors should show up as black, right? And this is your entire life's work if you're an illustrator. Now the thing is, if that software had a mode where even if it was delivered from the cloud, the runtime stayed on your computer and you would have to click a button to fetch the latest version and you never click that button, that threat from Pantone would have been useless because no Adobe customer would have ever pressed the update button ever again because they want their Pantones. So the existence of this gun on the mantelpiece for Pantone ensured that by Act 3 they were going to take it down and shoot every designer and illustrator in the world in the head with it. Right? And so designing your products so that they can't be downgraded means that the people that you license from can never force you to downgrade your products. Okay, um, we're out of time. Uh, in answer to the last question about you know the uh, the dad with the three kids, I totally I got three three kids and myself totally understand. That's really what groups like Secure Resilient Future Foundation are about, which is not all on you. Um, we as a community can bring a group together and do the work and be able to tell you like, hey, there's a hearing in your town, you know, maybe in your city, uh, maybe reach out to your local rep, write an email, here's an email, all you have to do is let us put your name on it and make it easy for you to be involved and also make you aware of what's happening so you're not, you know, dealing with all the noise of everything else that's going on in your life. So that's it. Right. Um, we have uh, iFixit tools, if you asked a question, or even not, come up here and help yourself. Uh, and uh, like thank you very much, and, th and give a big hand to this panel, um, really amazing. And thank all of you for turning up.